It was here, at Radley College, eight years ago, that the BBC made the documentary series Public School. Then, as now, it was a school for the sons of those parents who want to give their children not just a particular kind of education, but a certain indefinable advantage in life. The kind of advantage it's worth paying good money for. So, what happened to the boys who eight years ago went to and appeared in public school? The series started at the start of term. Each new term brings new parents and new children. For them, it's the beginning of a considerable five-year investment. J.M.H. Lovegrove is one of this term's crop of stigs, or new boys. He's about to take up residence in his new home, Sea Social. Later that evening, James Lovegrove and the other new boys assemble in chapel for a pep talk from the headmaster, or warden, a pep talk they're supposed to remember for the rest of their lives. Some of you are blessed with great brains, and some of you maybe not. That doesn't matter tuppence. What matters is how hard you're prepared to try. And if you do happen to be blessed with a good brain, and some of you are very fortunate in that respect, much more fortunate than me, then use it to the full. And I want you people to build up one habit on that side, the habit of work. It's not a habit which is terribly common these days, but I want you to acquire that habit. One thing I attach enormous importance to is the courtesies we show each other. It matters to me very much that you people should be able to look someone in the eye and smile and say good morning or good afternoon or good night. Remember that. And it matters to me all the little details. It matters to me that you should not speak to people with your hands in your pockets. It matters to me that you're smart, well turned out, that you've got polished shoes, that you've got your top button done up, all these little details. And I wonder how many of you have clean fingernails. These tiny little things make something that lasts, because you come to school for one thing, really to acquire the right habits for life. James Lovegrove is now 21. I think what the warden was telling us then, and uh, seeing it on the television program the other day, um, with the, the, the benefit of hindsight and that detachment you can get for, from watching it seven years, uh, was that we were taught the right habits for public school. I don't know what the right habits for life are. Uh, I think habits is possibly the wrong word, but there were certain things that were instilled in you at Radley, and they do stick with you for most of your life. I think it does a pretty good job at teaching you the right habits for success. What are they? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, whatever they are, I think they've been relatively well instilled in me. The right habits. No, I, I learned a lot from Radley. There's no doubt about that. I think you make your own habits up. I don't think uh, school or any other institution can teach you the right habits or wrong habits of life. I think that's up to your conscience and your instinct. The thing about going to public school is it gives you an incredible self-confidence. You have to be, you have to be very self-confident to survive. You have to build up um, the ability to, to adapt to situations and, and respond to people. Um, it really does, it teaches you to be quite go-getting, which I think is great. It, it's, it works on the rewards system, um, which is really a, a sort of microcosm of how real life works, and there's always this carrot before the donkey at school it's prizes or something like that and in real life it's it's more sort of financially oriented um and i think that's very good i think your typical public school boy is obviously seen it's often seen as overconfident but uh, i don't think it's overconfidence i think it's just extreme self-confidence and, and assurance which is which is a good thing this self-confidence is achieved not just by following the warden's advice but by total immersion in a whole new world of experience, which, despite the considerable fees paid by the parents, isn't always pleasurable for the children.
James Lovegrove is now studying at Oxford. He is, in Radley's terms, a success. The first ambition of private education is to supply successful candidates to universities in general, and in particular to Oxford, just five miles up the road from Radley, and to Cambridge. Donald Payne. There was never much doubt that Donald would come to Cambridge, but his private education was free. Eight years ago, he won the top academic scholarship to Radley. Congratulations, you've won the top scholarship at Radley. Top? Top, yep. Sewell. Yes, Sewell or whatever it's called, yes. Jolly good, well done. <laughs> now, I think that probably... Such early achievement does have its drawbacks. To start with, um, well, my first term, um, everybody expected, you know, everything of me. And I found that a bit difficult, but it, it didn't really bother me. Hello. Dad? Hello, my love. Um, you know that I've won this top scholarship. Oh, darling. I have, yeah. The top scholarship? Yep. To Radley. Yep. Full fees. When did you hear? Just now. Where are you? In Inky Study. Oh, many, many, many congratulations. I'm over the <clears throat> it was only as it got progressive that, you know, as I've been there for longer and longer, um, I probably unconsciously the pressure built up more and more. It wasn't just work because in the first few years I've been, you know, very successful at sport and was at well as well. Um, and just the whole time people were expecting me to succeed. Perhaps pressure is the price you pay for privilege, but academic scholarships don't provide the only opportunity for cut-price private education. Here at Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge, is another Radleyan who gained an assisted place, Tom Johnson, the top music scholar of 1980. I found it quite difficult at Radley to fit in other things as well as music. And there was pressure to do music and pressure to do sport, and it's quite hard to fit it all in and come out of it with some exam results. I mean, you are under an obligation. They're paying you so much money to do it for you per year. Um, perhaps that takes a lot of the spontaneity out of it. The obligation to play music is not one that Tom feels required to fulfil anymore. He'd rather play rugby. I'm not doing any music now, as I've told you, but that's basically because I'm quite busy enough here as it is. And I can do music and things when I can't do sport and the like, you know, later on in life, and there's only so many hours in one day. Music scholarships are competitively fought for. David Roper Curzon, heir to Lord Tenham, was one of the candidates. He also won a scholarship, but his hobby now is not music, but sculpture. I don't know whether it's improved now or not. But certainly when I was there, I, I, my general feeling was the music was um, was quite poor, really. I'm not, I'm, I think the first impression or the thing that stands out in my mind most of all was, um, was the apathy of many people who were at the school um, towards music. Having said that, I enjoyed the music lessons, and I had two very good teachers. Uh, but um, I didn't feel they were perhaps... I felt they were enthusiastic as teachers, as far as music was for Radley, but I didn't feel they were backed up so much by, by the general system. Jonathan Durrett also gained a music scholarship to the school his father was so keen he should attend. But now, Jonathan is studying to be a doctor. 
I wasn't left alone to, to feel that I wanted to play music. I, I had to play music, and I did play music, and I went through, and that's what I did. But I never really got down to it and studied hard at my music. I didn't want him to have a boarding school education like his um, sister and his elder brothers. In his case, since he's very good at the violin, I do want him to have expert teaching and a concentrated teaching, and I want him to have a good musical education as well as the ordinary academic education. And this, I think, he can only obtain in a boarding school and almost certainly a public school. There were so many things, that, different things that were going on and that you encouraged to do, sports and music and what have you, that in a way you were distracted from anything that you were particularly interested in and couldn't spend enough time doing that and nurturing a real interest in that and, and, and producing the spontaneity of, of work that you need to, to become really brilliant at something. I think um, you become mediocre at a lot of things. At English private schools, it seems, the arts are often overshadowed by other activities. Perhaps to compensate, Radley has just built a new concert hall. In my time, I doubt if we've produced more than 10 professional musicians. And there's a paradox in that, because we're always talking about excellence and the pursuit of excellence. We're always, at the same time, wringing our hands and saying, we ask too much of the boys. They're doing too many things. They never do anything well. It's an interesting argument, that. What you generally find is that the outstanding boys are doing a vast number of things outstandingly well and getting very tired in the process. Um, our job is really getting the less well-motivated, rather idler boy off his backside to go and search for that area in which he can do something that is recognizably excellent. But in answer to your original question, I can't deny that very often we're doing so many different things that we're doing none of them as well as we would like to do. I don't mind the happy amateur. You used a phrase the other day that we constantly use here, the Renaissance man, uh, the man who can join in in everything uh, artistic and creative and cultural. Uh, and perhaps uh, not be absolutely the tops in any of those particular things. I have no regrets about that. Uh, those are the interesting people in life. Eight years ago, Radley's most prominent Renaissance man was David Van Os, writer, as the the college, academic, the, sorry, the, mem the members of the council, and copy to every trustee. Hold your address off. Well, make sure you get a reply. Prefect, everyone, okay. but, I mean, athlete, extract full pressure. Ready. and political yeah. activist. You say here, uh, I think that there are better things to spend 50,000 on than a golf course. I thought you, you were giving them a questionnaire. Oh, no, I was asking... You were just making a statement. I was asking whether they agree with that or not. Um, the, I mean, the only thing is that you know, as well as I do, that, I mean, democracy or, it doesn't really work in a place like this. Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't set out to be a democratic yes. institution. And therefore, I mean, it sets I'll... out to be um, a, an ordinary yeah. school. I suppose it taught me a, a lasting dislike of centralised organisations, which is why, ever since then, I've always worked in very small firms. David has already worked for several small firms with varying degrees of success. He's now at a fine London address albeit in the basement, working to encourage industrial sponsorship in the arts. Perhaps not absolutely everything taught at public school is helpful. It creates in you a natural respect for authority that, depending on the kind of business you're in or whatever career you choose to follow, can either be a help or a hindrance. It did surprise me that several of, the, several of my contemporaries not the, um, who uh, were hostile to the authority in the school. Subsequently went on and joined further authoritarian structures. Um, I'm thinking of a couple of individuals who shortly after leaving the school, which they'd always uh, maintained a steady resistance to, then went and joined the army. The army, in fact, invests heavily in trying to attract the product of private education. 
Radley also has a combined cadet force, compulsory until a boy has passed his proficiency. A quarter of the school is in the army section, and another quarter is split between the Navy and the RAF. Some like the CCF, but Hugo Chapman certainly does not. I, I hate the CCF, and I repeat, hate, because I really loathe it. Mr Silk was always going on about how one should respect masters because they were masters. And, I, and that's what the basic job I always had, because I, I don't think one should respect masters because they're masters. One should respect them because they won your respect. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the masters at Radley, I don't think, were you know, necessarily worthy of respect. Nonetheless, it was Hugo Chapman's art teacher who fostered his love of fine art and led him, despite his youthful nonconformity, to work here in the centre of the London art establishment. I wish I could go somewhere where I could meet different people with different views, different backgrounds, they had different ideas about things. I think people who here tend to forget that, that they'll be brand if the rest of life is shifted. Yeah, I think that's one of the main things I don't like. I don't like being involved with something I, I despise and think should be stopped. It's extraordinary. Seeing oneself on the screen again, it is an uncomfortable experience. I think it's slightly uncomfortable because I think 16 or whenever I was then is a slightly awkward age. One's opinions are rather unformed. I mean, I feel probably the same thing, so I'd express them in rather more, hopefully, subtle ways and not be quite so outspoken. But I still feel basically I am the same person. Bastard. No, I'm out of the canoe, but you have to... You're sort of holding onto it. Yeah, you're meant to hold onto it, but I decide against it. The f*** hurt. Exactly. <laughs> Don't leave the canoe! Don't let the canoe go! Keep it in your You're standing there, just... Oh, poor Hugo. What did it fail to teach me? What 99% of the rest of, of the world was like, really. One was only my, my feelings today about um, the fact one was cut off from other sort of people of one's own age. I still feel, I still feel strongly about it. Two senior boys were featured in the series. James Eady and Rupert Gaither. Coming to the end of their school careers, their eyes were already fixed mm. upon their futures. James Eady is hoping to get into Cambridge. If he is to do so, he will first need to get good grades in his three A-levels, English, French and History. James got three A-grades, went to Cambridge and is now practising as a solicitor in the Inns of Court in London. Okay, get up. Edie's friend Rupert Gaither is hoping to get into Oxford. He too will need to get good grades in his A-levels, which are also English, French and history. Rupert didn't manage to get into Oxford, and after prep school and public school, now finds himself in the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, another all-male environment. Well, if it trying to ask me whether, whether I'm a puff. <coughs> then he answers no. Um, yes, I went to all boys prep school and, pu and public school, and I see absolutely nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that at all, because, you know, you've got all the rest of your life to do all the things you really want to do. I think it's probably a very popular misconception about the army that we sit all day with men, etc., etc. Et yes, I work in an all-male environment, but up till very recently, so did, so did most other people. And if you go down to the darker recesses of, to use example again, of the city, or to 90% um, of the, of the um, for example, engineering factories in this country, you'll be working in an all-male environment. Yes, I live in a um, in a mess with all sorts of, uh, with all, all the other guys. But I also live in a mess, precisely, and many people tell me the whole time. But the door isn't locked. 
And I've got a motor car. And I've got an address book. And he has all the toys the modern army can give a growing boy. Rupert, the army was in fact a way out of an even more conventional job. Friends of mine were spending hours and hours and hours filling out these long application forms for jobs in the city and all that sort of thing. And in many respects, it was like sort of all seemed to be like a whirlpool taking me down into the city, and it was just something I, I really didn't want to do. I think, to be honest, it's it's a, a whirlpool that Radley deliberately feeds into. Radley, as far as I was concerned, I, I know it's that Dennis Silk did say it once or twice, was almost a sort of a middle-of-the-road, aimed to be a middle-of-the-road school. There's no chance, there's very little chance, of there ever being a, a prime minister coming from Radley. As, and Dennis Silk will probably be the first to admit it, or anyone truly exceptional coming from Radley. But I don't think it aims at that. Radley, I think, aims at producing a decent, for want of a better expression, a decent chap. Um, and that suits the city, suits the city very well. As candidate for the National Front in Radley's mock election, it's perhaps not so surprising that Rupert didn't feel that the city was the place for him. Let it go down. We, we have need for a strong government, one with courage and, above all, patriotism. patriotism. But Radley also fielded a candidate for the Workers' Revolutionary Party, Tim Huxley. has seen the major political parties and our political system as a whole drag it down for years. The time is right for revolution! Tim Huxley now works in the city. When I, when I was at Radley, I mean, I was a bit of a, a revolutionary, I suppose, in my, in my thinking. I didn't go around burning the place down, but I, I was a bit radical in my politics. That was more often than not, a reaction against some of these boys who were there who seemed to have been fully paid up members of the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Conservative Club since the day they were conceived and were not prepared to look at anywhere outside the, the rules of Thatcherism. But looking back, I mean, 79, the summer of 79, that was when the Conservative government came to power. And I haven't done badly under them. Uh, you know, I now have a, a good job. I got a I got an education out of them, you know, a degree at university, which didn't cost me a penny. Uh, and uh, I have a good job, and I have my own house. Uh, I've done all right under Thatcherism. And also, uh, capitalism is a lot more fun than socialism. It's a common complaint against English education in general, and English private education in particular, that the teaching of more or less useless subjects only equips people for more or less useless jobs. We were harangued at the headmaster's conference by Corelli Barnett about this, that we're teaching too much classics, um, too many totally theoretical subjects which have no application out in the job market. I suppose uh, we might be open to that sort of criticism, but I think much less so, although I still don't feel that schools should be centres of vocational training. I think they are centres of mind training and I still feel that an intelligent boy who has for instance done Latin and Greek particularly if he's managed to do Greek verses will be able to do anything because he's got a trained mind that can actually apply itself to any problem that comes up. The relative merits of academic or vocational education were largely lost on the boys themselves especially at school dances when other subjects entirely seem to occupy their minds. He's got all red, you see. At first, things progress normally, but by 11.30, when the dance ends, it will all be very different. there 
when they leave. There's one thing they haven't got a clue about, it's how to handle women. Uh, and uh, certainly some of my lady friends would still say that I, ha I have that. I believe it's single, single, single sex education is not a good thing, it's not healthy, and it's not real. Well, it fails for an obvious reason to teach you anything about women, <laughs> because there's none of them there. If I was Dennis Silk now, I I'd take girls, because I think the tide has moved so far that way. And nowadays, women are in every aspect of life, and the chances are that you will work with women. That I think it's a, it's a significant failing not to have them there. I haven't found Radleyans too backward when it came to girls. Um, they have a very lively social life in the holidays. I always feel they come back to school for a bit of a rest on that front. Um, I think that uh, I may find myself in a minority, but I'm totally unrepentant about that. Radley, too, is unrepentant and growing apace. The golf course against which David Van Os campaigned is now in situ, and the school has recently opened a new sports hall and a new swimming pool. After all, a public school is just a business. It needs to attract new customers and make sure its old products become customers in the future. If you're asking whether I'll send any children that I have to Radley, I've thought about this quite a lot. The answer is not automatically. If I had a son now, of the right age, I would send him to Radley. I would definitely send, if I can afford to send him to public school, I would definitely send him to public school and probably to Radley. I wouldn't send one of my children to Radley. Providing I could afford it, I would certainly consider sending my, my son into private education. Possibly to Radley, yes. I think I would send them to a public school um, or, uh, or private school. I'm not quite sure I'd send them to Radley. Looking back on it, what you could have done is you could have given us all a big cheque when we were 21 or you could have sent us all to Radley. Uh, the bottom line is I think he got a far better uh, return on his investment by spending the money on our education. And I would, to that extent, I would send my sons to Radley if I had any children. But it's no small investment. Private education at Radley from 13 to 18 would now cost a parent a total of £30,000. What is it that they think they're buying at such a price? Right to Habits for Life. <laughs>